Greetings, members and friends of Emmanuel United Church of Christ. As always, so pleased that you've decided to join us here for our final session in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. We've come to the very end of this great epistle. We've spent a few weeks reflecting on the armor of God, and now we come to the final section of that armor of God piece with one new item that has no connection whatsoever to a Roman soldier's accoutrements. It is a completely new piece of, if you will, armor. It's a piece that has no comparison in the Roman soldier's equipment, and we're going to be looking at that, this thing called prayer. And so before we begin, I want to read the final section that we're looking at. We'll overlap just a little bit with previous weeks, just so you can see how this new piece of equipment connects to the other pieces of the so-called armor of God. Paul concludes his letter by writing, Stand therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the blessed breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. All those we've covered in previous weeks. And then Paul continues, Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. Tychicus, Tychicus will tell you everything. He is a dear brother and a faithful minister in the Lord. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are and to encourage your hearts. Peace be to the whole community and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who have an undying love for our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the passage we'll consider in a message titled, The Christian's Battle Cry, Praying Over the Pieces of the Armor of God. Now, for those of you who've been with me for a while in my ministry, you know there are certain quotes that I just love to use, and I use them over and over again. For example, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. A beautiful quote about trying to live together with all of our differences in love. Or this quote, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from religious conviction. That's Blaise Pascal, who also, also provides another quote I use a lot. There's enough evidence for those who want to believe. There's never enough evidence for those who do not want to believe. But perhaps the quote I've used more than any other quote in my ministry again and again is a quote that's attributed to both Philo and to Plato. We really don't know who it is. It's one of those anonymous, but you've heard it because I've said it again and again. Be kind for everyone you know is fighting some kind of battle. Be kind for everyone you know is fighting some kind of battle. We are all caught up in some kind of battle. And Paul recognized this as he was chained to a Roman soldier in prison. He understood that we as Christians fight a very unique kind of battle. And he looked over at this Roman soldier and understood that we fight a battle like a soldier does, but it's a different kind of battle with a different kind of king with different kinds of weapons and goals. And that's where he begins to speak about the armor of God, but he completely redefines the armor of God to both compare and contrast it with a Roman soldier's equipment. He speaks of the belt of truth, our call to have truth at the center of all we do and truthfulness and integrity in our lives. 
He speaks of the breastplate of righteousness, which protects our heart, knowing the righteousness that God has both imputed to us and is imparting to us through the Spirit. He speaks of the boots of the gospel of peace so that our lives are to be rooted in seeking to be peacemakers with others because we are at peace with God. He speaks of the shield of faith, which invites us to, through faith, to deal with all the flaming missiles and accusations and temptations of the evil one. He speaks of the helmet of salvation, which has to do with the hope of God's ultimate end being accomplished in our lives and in the world. And then he ends with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, this precise tool that allows us uh, to both defend ourselves and to deal with any kind of attacks. Paul tells us to take up these pieces, to fasten them on, to put them into our lives and to never take them off because we are all fighting some kind of battle so that truthfulness and righteousness and peace and faith and hope become a part of our character. But now he comes to one more piece and this final piece means that he must leave the metaphor of armor and the Roman soldier essentially fades from view as he moves to prayer. He says in verse 18, pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. Prayer here is not identified with any piece of Roman armor and the reason is very obvious. Prayer accomplishes things we can't do by our own effort or through our own organization or skill. He wants all of these virtues that come with the armor of God to be accompanied with prayer because all of those virtues can accomplish very little without divine empowerment. And it is through prayer that we express our dependence on God. It's the way we intentionally recognize and rely on God's presence. And that's why when he speaks of prayer, he speaks of it pervasively. Notice, Four times the word all is used. Now it's translated a little different here, but it's always all. Pray in the spirit at all times, in all prayers and supplications. Keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. All, 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 all. This repetition underscores for Paul how important prayer is for all of life. It is to pervade and to permeate all that we do. There's a wonderful hymn called Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, which I'll refer to here by the time we are done, which has this great line, put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. So Paul speaks four times of all prayer. He speaks of all types of prayer in all prayers and supplications, which is a way of saying all prayers, whether they are long prayers or short prayers, whether they are written prayers or extempor extemporaneous, ones we come up with on the spot, whether they are sung prayers or whispered prayers, whether they are quiet thoughts or shouts of praise. We have so many models in the scripture. Our Lord Jesus Christ gives us that beautiful Lord's Prayer, which you can say in under 20 seconds. And we also have in the Psalter, Prayers that are hundreds of verses long, whether it's short, whether it's long, whether we have a formula like the Acts formula, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, and we kind of go through a pattern or whether we just sit in contemplation. We seek to just quietly find ourselves in the presence of God. The point is that all of these prayers are a way to engage with God to seek the assistance from God's spirit, to align our lives with the gospel of Christ. And Paul here is saying in all your prayers, in all your supplications, long, short, quiet, loud, make sure that you are committed to all forms of prayer and particularly whichever form at this point in your life is the most valuable. At different times in our lives, we might need structured and written prayers because we just simply can't come up with the words on our own. At other times, we might need to just simply quietly sit in the Lord's presence and recognize that we find our center in the life and love of God. So we're to pray 
all types of prayers. And Paul says, in all times, good times, bad times, depressing times, ecstatic times, so that when we experience something good or beautiful, we need to recognize every gift comes from God and thank God for the gift. When we're tempted, we need to ask for divine strength. When we're in darkness, we need to ask for light. Again, this is where the Psalter can help us. The Psalms reveal the breadth and depth of the circumstances and emotions in which we need to cry out to God in prayer. We might be glad and we praise. We might be sad and we need to lament. We might be mad and we need to speak out words of anger. We might be fearful and we need to simply cast ourselves upon God's grace. It's very interesting. If you look at prayer in the scriptures, you'll find there are three postures, and those postures kind of help you understand all the different varieties of circumstances we might experience in prayer. There is the posture of prostration, where one is bowing or kneeling or just completely flat on the ground. And that posture expresses times we need to be submissive and surrendering. There is the posture of the hands being folded, showing humility, showing dependence. And then there is the most popular posture, that of the eyes open and the arms outstretched, looking up into the sky as a child would to his or her parent and recognizing that we are caught up in the life and love of God. So we're to pray all kinds of prayers in every kind of circumstance, and Paul says, with all perseverance. Not giving up on prayer, even when our prayers appear to be unanswered. There's no situation that should stop our prayers. There's places to pray lament when we're sad. There's places to pray in anger. There are places to pray in loss. You see, we are to pray in all circumstances with all perseverance because to stop praying is to stop pursuing God. And we must recognize even when we feel abandoned, even when we are frustrated, even when we're sad and lonely, God is with us. So perhaps there are times when our prayer is just simply reduced to sighs and groans, and we've looked at that on different Wednesday nights. But sighs and groans are still prayer. They are signs of hope and signs of life, even if we're just groaning, even if we're just sighing. Paul says, keep alert in all perseverance, because our tendency is like Peter, James, and John with Jesus in Gethsemane to fall asleep, to grow weary. But we must not stop prayer when we're weary. That's perhaps when we need it most. We are to persevere. Perhaps one of the ways we can make sure that happens is we try to find a pattern or rhythm of life and make sure that that rhythm doesn't include just waiting to pray till the end of the day because that's when we are the tiredest. That's when we are the least alert. I know this from reading. If you want to read a book, the worst way to read is to read like the few minutes before you're going to go to bed because you'll inevitably just simply fall asleep while you're reading. You won't get too far. You won't read too fast. So that just like reading, if we want to really stay alert in prayer, we shouldn't just have prayer for the final moments of our day. Now, that's better than nothing. Trust me. But it's true that if we kind of wait till our final moments, we probably won't stay awake or be alert with all perseverance. So with all perseverance, with all types of prayers, in every type of situation, we are to pray. And I want to bring this back up on the screen again so you can see this for all the saints so that our concern is not just to be for ourselves. We're to pray for the entire church, for the cause of God, not only in our local community, but around the world, because part of this battle cry of the Christian is not just simply a concern for our own welfare, but it is a concern for the whole church of Jesus Christ. It's a devotion to the welfare of others, especially fellow believers. And it's at this point that prayer becomes an act of love 
toward others. We are not just showing our devotion to God in prayer, we're showing our devotion toward others. As we seek others' good and not just our own, as we intercede on behalf of others, which is a mark of true selflessness. In fact, this is exactly a mark of Christ's likeness because the very thing that our risen Lord Jesus Christ is doing in the heavens right now is interceding on behalf of God's people. And we become like our Christ as we selflessly intercede on behalf of others. So we are to pray all types of prayer in all types of circumstances with all perseverance for all the saints. Do you hear all the alls? We are to, and Ira Groff puts this so well when he writes, pray always, pray always. This is in contrast to what John Stott says, most Christians pray sometimes with some prayers and some degree of perseverance for some of God's people, but we're to pray always and all ways. So that Karl Barth hits the mark when he says, nothing less is suggested in this passage than that the life and strife of the saints be one great prayer to God that this prayer be offered in ever new forms, however good or bad the circumstances, and that this prayer not be self-centered, but express the need and hope of all the saints. Now that can seem a bit overwhelming. We might feel that we're not quite rising up to this standard, but do not be demoralized, dear beloved friends. Therese of Lizzo puts it so well when she says, you feel incompetent in prayer? That's okay. Prayer arises from incompetence. Otherwise, there is no need for it. Or as Thomas Merton puts it, and I use this quote a lot too, in regard to prayer, we are all beginners. So we are to pray always and to pray all ways. And it's in light of this that Paul now makes a prayer request of his own in verse 19. He says, pray for me that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul clearly knows with humility that he needs the prayers of others. And he constantly asks for others' prayers in all of his letters. He's wise enough to know that the thing he needs to ask from those who support him, from those who love him, is not just simply financial support, but he needs their prayerful support. He needs the prayers of the church empowering him to have the courage and boldness to speak with frankness, to speak fearlessly, to speak as an ambassador in chains. He's going through some very hard times, and in these hard times, he's prone to depression or feeling frustrated, to give up or to stop trying, and his greatest concern is that the Church of Jesus Christ would support him in their prayers, that he might not give up hope himself. I find it very interesting that Paul doesn't pray, hey, pray that I'd get out of prison, because he knows he's an effective witness wherever he's at. And he doesn't pray for release from suffering or self-sacrifice. He knows he's an ambassador in chains. He knows he's fighting a great battle, just as everyone is fighting a great battle. He doesn't pray for freedom from all that he's going through. He prays for the freedom to make the most of the opportunity that he is caught up in, whether it is good or bad. So that's the call, this final piece of equipment that has no connection whatsoever to a Roman soldier's equipment. It is this all prayer, all times, all perseverance for all the saints. And it invites us to reflect, are we committed to these things as well. Because we might have this righteousness and truthfulness and all these other things that come with the armor of God, but all of those virtues are activated by prayer. Because prayer accomplishes what we cannot accomplish through our own effort or organization or strength. Prayer is the means through which the armor becomes 
more than just virtues. It is the means through which it connects us to God and to God's will and to working out the mission of Jesus Christ. It is through prayer that we commune with God and we come to know God's presence in the battles we are facing. That's why I love this line from the old hymn, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. You might know the melody, I won't uh, sing it. Stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. Ye dare not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never wanting there. Prayer is the battle cry of the Christian, always standing ready at all times in all prayers for all the saints, that the gospel might go forth in the Spirit's power to the glory of God and for the welfare of others. There's a lot more we could say about prayer, but the most important thing when it comes to prayer is simply to do it and to remember as we do it in the battles we face, we should be kind for everyone we know is fighting some kind of battle. And one of those ways to show divine kindness is to pray for others. Keep this hope before you. And in keeping this hope before you, I wanna share in closing this final line from Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, because we all fight some kind of battle now, but there is the hope of salvation, this helmet of salvation, that final stanza, stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day, the noise of battle, the next, the victor's song. To those who vanquish evil, a crown of life shall be. They with the king of glory shall reign eternally. And that is the Christian's battle cry. Well, we've come to the end of this epistle to the Ephesians. It's a wonderful conclusion. Paul has spoken of the glory of the gospel and how God is working to bring about God's purposes in Christ to fruition that all might be united in Christ. And yet, even though that remains true, there is a battle we face, but it is a different kind of battle. It is a battle of love as we fight as soldiers of peace seeking to support others in whatever battle they're going through, recognizing that our call is to be people of prayer, putting on God's armor so we can stand and stand firm in the evil day. Well, we're gonna conclude this by speaking some more about this at tonight's After the Through the Bible Zoom chat. We'll take questions, we'll think about the whole letter. Next week is Ash Wednesday, and we'll have a special Ash Wednesday service here online. But if you'd like to join us for the After the Through the Bible Zoom chat, the link is down below. The password is same for regulars. If you need the password, contact Jenny or me. And until we connect again, I leave you with these words. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessed fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.